Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to continue our scholarly examination of Epic Illustrated Magazine. We're up to the 29th issue, April 1985. We start off with, which I think, one of the best covers Epic's ever had. I think this is in the top five. This is Stephen Hickman, a fantasy painter. Uh, I don't think he's ever done comics, but um, did many fantasy and sci-fi paperback covers all throughout the 80s, 90s, price till today. I love this cover. Really nice. Um, just one of those uh, paintings that just has a story behind it. You don't know what it is, but uh, very narrative. Something's going on here. And we shall soon find out that the editors of Epic thought the same thing and uh, made a comic about it. Contents page. Overview of contributors. And we start off with Night Run by Kent Williams. Uh, Kent Williams uh, has been in probably the five, five or no, four or five epics in the past like 10 issues. They discovered him. I think some of his first work was an epic and we've seen his progression, am amazing progression. I mean, he was pretty damn good when he started. His first story is pretty nice. But now this is the Kent Williams that we all know. The fully beautifully painted art, um, pretty impeccable, pretty amazing stuff. This is also, uh, he wrote it, wrote this and drew it which I think is maybe the first story that he's written and drawn by himself. And uh, this is uh, not much of a story, but God, the art's beautiful. But it, it's well written, you know, like the captions and it's, it's almost like kind of poetic. And it's about this werewolf. And, you know, when he's human, he's got this dilemma because the he's in love with this woman the object of his lust and his bloodlust. So when he's a werewolf, he wants to kill her. And when he's human, he's totally in love with her and attracted to her. So he's got to do something about that. This beautiful Ken Williams shit. God, look at that. That looks like a European graphic album. I mean, it's really nice stuff. So basically what he did is, you know, as a human with his uh, conscious mind, he hired this like monster hunter the guy who specializes in killing werewolves because he knew he'd turn into a werewolf, werewolf and go after his beloved. So this guy shows up and takes care of him. And he dies. But he, uh, he protected his beloved from his own lycanthropic lusts. That's fucking gorgeous. Look at this. Really nice stuff. Uh, <laughs> but then we get to the last Galacta story, chapter four. I know I've said this before, but it boggles my mind that, you know, this is 1985. Literally three years earlier, even two years earlier, John Byrne was one of the best superhero comics artists. I think, at least in my humble opinion, <laughs> that ever existed. Such a good superhero artist. His X-Men, his Captain America run, everything. Iron Fist, all that stuff is gorgeous. And how could he get this bad so quickly? I mean, the anatomy on her, Nova's, uh, it's just, I'm not even saying it's off. I'm just saying it's just unappealing. It's just, it has no verve. It has no energy. It's just crap. I mean, Terry Austin is busted his balls inking the shit out of the backgrounds and inking whatever crappy figures John Byrne, you know, pencils. 
But yeah, this is uh, just very dull stuff. So she's back on Earth. She meets this robot who's uh, kind of annoying. He speaks in iambic pentameter. He's he's like a poet r robot who like loves Shakespeare. And he shows her the last human city before they all died out. And then Galactus calls her back. And Galactus says, where are those few mortals Galactus once called friend? He's talking about the Fantastic Four. And she's like, do you jest, Master? Um, they're long gone. So it's almost like, uh, you know, Galactus is having a senior moment. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. They're, they must be long dead. But I made a vow to them never to, you know, feed on Earth because Galactus eats planets. But I guess that vow is not null and void now. They're long dead. So Galactus is getting ready. He's going to eat Earth. And to be continued. Here we have a little portfolio of the art of Jose Segrelas. He was like one of the earliest fantasy kind of weird artists. Um, he was like drawing in the 20s. And I think he was drawing all the way through the 60s. And... Uh, you know, he was admired by Frank Frazetta, Boris Vallejo, Mike Kaluta. Like, this guy is, uh, was one of the first. Unfortunately, this isn't on the slick paper. Sometimes Epic does some bad printing. They didn't have perfect printing. It's Everything looks way too dark here. It's a little muddy, too. But it looks really interesting, what you can see. I've, uh... I don't think I've ever seen this Jose Segrelas guy. This looks really interesting, but I can barely see what's going on. It's so muddy. It's uh, from Wagner's uh, Tetralogy, the, the Ring Cycle. Oh, this is nice. We got a, the return of John Zack. Um, this is another guy that Epic discovered, you know, um, I think uh, maybe six to eight issues ago. We saw his first story. This one's called Writer. And uh, God, his art is just so psychedelic and crazy. I got to be honest. Sometimes I, I can't quite tell what's going on in them. It looks so fucking good, though. So it's almost like I don't care. Like, I'm... For example, here's a, the narrator saying, I am Asher, traveler, explorer, wanderer. And uh, on my uh, my steed of flesh and circuitry, Naskald, I ride. <laughs> and so obviously we see this steed. But for the life of me, I can't see the guy who's riding him. I don't know where the steed ends and the rider is. But it looks so fucking cool and bizarre I think I told you last time this guy draws like three times the size of the page so it's kind of a shame like this shit needs to be printed at like 11 by 17 everything's so tiny maybe it would be more clear but suffice to say I love this shit yeah I can't tell every little inch of what's happening but it looks amazing the colors the god how much details in every page So he comes across this queen traveling through the, the land with her soldiers. And she says, hey, you want to ride? <laughs> you want to ride on my steed? And she gets on it. And uh, he takes her back to her city. And here she is sitting on her dragon throne. And she dismisses all of her lackeys and she makes love to him. I hope you can see this on a big screen. This shit's amazing. This is just pure psychedelia. So I guess for days and weeks, 
uh, he's her concubine. I don't know if that's a gender neutral word. Concubino. And uh, one night, though, he wakes up. And she's gone. She's not in the bed. So he searched everywhere. And he couldn't find her. But he discovered that they were making steeds like his. His. Making them into machines of war. Walking, striding machines. Massing on the plains before the keep. Soulless, artless totally mechanized creations that mockingly duplicated my gentle Naskald. And on the lead machine is the queen. And she looks at him and she just crudely laughs. And then turned around and rode her machine to her foes, you know, attacking some poor city. And I guess the other city had some weapons and they destroy each other. With that Naskal's melting of flesh and circuit, the war machines faltered and froze. So he crawls back to the queen's castle and he finds Naskal cold, unmoving and dead. To learn its secrets, they dissected him. I am Ashir and Ryder no more. Pretty sad ending. But I mean, who cares? This art is just amazing. So good. I gotta look up John Zack. I don't, I think I did. I think he's done no other comics other than these few epic stories. Here we have Frank Kelly Fries, uh, a little portfolio of his stuff. Uh, he's a the, you know famous science fiction author, sorry, writer. Damn it. <laughs> Artist, I meant to say. I should apologize. I just came back from my uh, a work party. And they gave us free booze. <laughs> and so I had a few drinks. So sorry about my uh, idiocy. But, you know, Frank Kelly Fries has been drawing for like, God, what, 40, 50 years at this point. Started with the pulps. He was his early pulp illustrations. He did the uh, album cover art for Queen News of the World. And he drew for Mad Magazine, did many covers for Mad. So I don't know if you guys remember Phil Hale. He was another epic discovery. Uh, probably a few issues ago, they published his first story. So now we have two st uh, short stories from Phil Hale. This one's just a one-pager. And we just see this guy and... This guy comes up to him and he just beats the shit out of him. And it says, in the future, there will be no matters. So it's just a little gag. Then we see Knock Knock. And we see these two guys on post-apocalyptic Earth. They're going around scavenging stuff. So one of the, guy, one of the guys hears this knocking trying to find out what it is and he finds this big drum canister and when he pops the top this fucking crazy monster comes out that's just nuts Phil Hale man I mean this guy just came out of the gate with some wicked chops I mean he can draw I mean just look at these hands how good those monster hands are he totally crushes the guy and just brings him down into the canister with him. So then his buddies are like, Leroy, where you at? And he goes to find him and he sees the same drum and it's knocking again. And he's all happy. He's like, ooh, this probably got something valuable in it. So not much of a story, but some uh, wicked cool art. We have another Dr. Watchstop story from Ken Macklin. And uh, Dr. Watchstop and his pilot are on this, see this planet. 
and there's no sign of life. But there are these like, kind of like a markers, these stone markers that are all in this total pattern, which definitely implies that they were the creation of a, you know, sentient, intelligent life. But there's not a sign of any life in the planet. So it's very curious. So they're basically just in quandary. And then the pilot says, hey, we're running low on gas. we got to return. we got to leave. And as they fly off, <laughs> this the markers, we see like one of their eyes opens. And he says, hey, dad, little brother keeps getting out of line. So that was the sentient life. Or sapient life, if you will. Once again, just beautiful art. Art and colors, you know, painted colors from Ken Macklin. I just hate the way he draws <laughs> characters. Everything else is perfect and gorgeous. Beautiful cartooning. But I just don't, you know, it's kind of goofy looking. Oh, man. Once again, we got Rick Veitch in Epic. Rick Veitch has probably appeared to more epics than anyone. Thank God. Because he's usually the bright spot of every epic. This one's amazing. It's called Ghosts in the Machine. We see this like video world. It's kind of like Tron. Um, I guess, you know, a few years later, they call it a cyber reality or something, you know? And we see these like robotic soldiers. And we got Scrim and Quid. And they're leading a bunch of uh, new issues behind enemy lines. That's basically the newbies. Um, Sergeant Rock would call, would call them green apples. And Scrim, the pink one, is kind of like, I don't like this, man. We shouldn't have brought these, these new issues so far behind enemy lines. And uh, Quid is more just like, hey, man, they need their combat experience. They got to learn sometime. This art is, uh, in the overview, they describe that Rick Veitch did like three overlays for this. You know, he drew it in pencil. Then he did this overlay to get this crazy coloring effect. It almost looks like they're video images. It's pretty cool. So one of the uh, new issues, Ding, his name is, says, can I ask you guys a question? And he says, you know, back at boot camp, uh, we heard these rumors about ghosts that when one of us gets killed, <coughs> excuse me, that when one of us gets killed, we turn in a ghost. And uh, Quid says, listen here, there ain't no ghosts. It's just a programming phenomena. And Scrim says, come on, Quid. We've seen a lot of ghosts, and they're not just programming phenomena. There's something weird going on there. And Ding says, "What? What do the ghosts say?" And he says, "Not much, kid. They mostly they mostly just laugh." That's some impressive, crazy graphics here. Rick Veitch is kind of a genius. <laughs> but, you know, this is before computer coloring, anything like that. He just figured out how to do this crazy effect. So all of a sudden they detect an enemy. It's called a clicker scud wagon. It's a, an enemy ship. So they make up a quick plan. The newbies are all gonna like get in a circle and hold on to each other. They're basically gonna scramble the ships uh, just, they're gonna kind of disrupt, um, disrupt the um, sensors on the enemy ship. And while they do that, they're gonna uh, get their gun ready. The gun has to be warmed up, it takes a little time and blow it out of the sky. 
yeah, they're making an anti-mag field. But uh, they say that whatever you do, don't let go. So Ding is panicking. He's like, it's too strong, we'll never hold. And Ding uh, loses it. He says, it's no use, our only chance is to anchor in. And he lets go of all the, his fellow soldiers' hands. And they're instantly obliterated. So uh, Scrim and Quid have enough time, though, to destroy the ship. But they know that many other ships are going to see that or hear that and show up soon. So they're like, we got to hightail it out of here. And then they hear, they think all the newbies are dead, but they hear a voice. It's Ding. Ding is still alive, but his, his legs have been ripped off. And he says that he can hear the ghosts taunting him, laughing and howling. So then it's a clicker troop carrier. And they grab Ding and they drag him. And they're like, damn it, they got our backs to the wall. Even the in the we're we're in the proverbial corner. So in this like video, whatever this is, computer reality, there's actually like a, a wall that um it's a finite space. They've never gone beyond the wall, supposedly beyond the wall. That's where the ghosts are. It's like the void. And you know, unless you want to die, you don't go through it. But Quid says, we got no choice. We're totally cornered. We got to go through the wall. I mean, it's the void, but we're going to die here. And sure enough, one of the enemy soldiers blasts Quid. And Quid is really messed up. So they hear a ghost. Cause Ding died. And they're laughing. I can see it, it's so beautiful. They're calling me. I'm coming and just effortlessly pass through the wall. So the enemy ship's particle beam is trying to locate them. And they're like, we're dead, we gotta do it. And uh, they jump through the wall into the void. You know, I'm sorry, Ding isn't dead yet. Sorry I said that. So they're still dragging Ding through this void. And they hear the ghosts again, laughing. And Scrim is feeling worse and worse, running out of energy. And then all of a sudden the ghosts grab Ding, well, half of Ding, and they pull him way into whatever ghost land. And so, uh, Quid says, I'll feed you some power, Scrim, to keep you alive. But by the time he turns around to do that, Scrim uh, has already given up the ghost. Scrim is dead. I can't remember if I told you the title of this story, Ghost in the Machine. It's very apropos. And uh, Quid is very bereft. He's just like, we fought side by side since we were new issues. You saved my ratchet more times than I can count. And then he hears this ghostly voice with the laughter. Why quit? I never knew you cared. And Quid is like, Scrim, is that you? But you're dead. And Scrim says, wrong. I'm alive, more alive than I've been in a long time. The whole squad is here. We want to take you with us. And for that, you have to be disassembled. So they're taking, basically ripping his armor off, or at least opening him up. And he's like, get away from me, I don't want to die. And he says, they say, you've forgotten what lies buried under the armor you wear. 
when you see, you'll be laughing as hysterical, hysterically as we are. No, you're lying. You're not real. You're just programming phenomena. And then we see his, from his point of view, his faceplate opens. And there's all these humans there. But they've got like electrodes in their head and their body. Kind of like Jack's. And it's Quid. And she says, Scrim, it's me. I'm sorry, Quid, it's me, Scrim. This is Scrim, sorry. This is what I looked like before I was encased in that android body. We were terrorists, Quid. The authorities programmed us to work out our aggressive tendencies of the machine so it would be fit to rejoin society. Now it's over. We can enjoy life as real human beings again. You and I together, just like we used to be. And then the camera finally turns around and you see Quid. <laughs> so scary. He looks like a fucking madman. And he picks up his gun and just mows them all down. This look of just terror on his face. And then he puts his armor back on and goes back into the computer reality. And he just says to himself, uh, programming phenomena. So in his mind, this was just all, you know, fictive, you know, whatever, made up stuff. Really good sci-fi. I mean, this is like a great Harlan Ellison short story. I mean, Philip K. Dick on his worst day, but still, like, this is one of the best sci-fi stories I think we've read in Epic. It's good stuff. Here we have uh, Zorin Vinjaka which is nice after last issue's Getty and Plexus adventure. Um, it's weird, when he draws in this black and white uh, style, his art looks so different. It's more stylized. Frankly, it's not as good. I definitely prefer Getty and Plexus. But this one's kind of interesting. It's called The Apes of a Cold God. And it takes place in the time of the Crusades. We see this Christian crusader, crusader and here's some uh, Muslim knights. And he attacks them in the name of God. And he kicks some serious ass. He mows to, he's totally outnumbered, but he mows to these guys. And then finally his horse collapses. And then the Arab, or the Muslim knight who was attacking him, his horse collapses, and the crusader, the Christian crusader, is going to kill him, and he realizes he's just a boy. He's a teenager. And he says, no more killings in thy name, O Lord. Let me embrace this infidel with love, not with a sword. And all of a sudden, <coughs> uh, they're both sucked up into the sky. The Crusaders saying, hallelujah. And all their like armor is ripped off and their clothes, even their hair is shorn from their head. So they're naked as babies as they're sucked up to this, you know, heavenly place. And then they see what they think is the face of God. And the crusader says, oh Lord, what am I supposed to do? And we see they're in this little arena and there's all these other beings that look just like God. And he says, well, don't you know the only thing you wretched creatures were programmed to do, fight to entertain us. <clears throat> and then we realize that the title is a quote from Karl Marx. You know, he was an atheist. We are the apes of a cold God. And I, I just love this theological view of God. Yeah, if there is a God, I don't think there is. But if there is one, he's probably more like this than, you know, like the Santa Claus guy we see in the Bible. He's especially the New Testament. I mean, obviously, look at the state of the world. At, at best, if there is a God, we're just play things for him. We entertain him with our conflicts and our... Bullshit. 
So now we have uh, the latest chapter of Cobalt 60, written by Larry Todd, artwork by Mark Bodet. We see Cobalt 60 with his little buddy, and uh, they meet the Croc people. The Crocs are just uh, kind of like mercenaries, and they're dumb as fucking rocks. They're really stupid. So Cobalt 60 finds their leader, a uh, general history. And, like, he's so dumb. He just says, hey, remember how I told you and you promised you were going to help me uh, um, get rid of the robot soldiers and take that IRS treasure, remember? And he's just like, no, but that sounds kind of good, okay. Like, he just totally tricks them and convinces them that, yeah, you guys got to help us. Because as we saw last issue, the aliens in cahoots with the Radio City people are, are going to get this hoard of treasure. And Cobalt 60 wants to beat them to the punch. We see now Radio City. I really like that. Nice architecture there. And Polonium 210 is getting back from his latest mission. That's the Prime Minister. And he's reporting to Strontium 90 about what happened and how he met these aliens. And he promised them told them the whereabouts of this dragon horde and they'll split it. But that was all just a ruse. He just wants their spaceship. He's like, we can get their spaceship and we can leave this, you know, shithole of a planet. So he's tell, um, Strontium 90 wants to come. So he says, okay, but we're gonna have to dress you up and not tell anyone you're the emperor because you'll be taken as a hostage. So you just pretend to be my assistant. So we see the armies of Radio City amassing. They're gonna like sneak attack these aliens when they show up at the IRS horde. And then they head off to meet the aliens and betray them. So that's it for this issue. Continued. So here we get the story, A Matter of Vengeance. This is the story based on the cover. Archie Goodwin liked the narrative aspects of the cover so much, he was like, this screams out for a story. But it took a little while. So Stephen Hickman's cover was supposed to be on last issue. That's why there was that last minute Rush Kaluta cover, which was just a reprint of something from his portfolio from years earlier. So it's kind of annoying because, you know, Archie Goodwin wrote the story. And for some reason, with all his connections as the editor of Epic, all the great artists he's had, he gets Rich Buckler to draw it. The, you know, mainstream superhero kind of hack artist ever since the early 70s. And, I mean, it's not the worst shit you've ever seen, but it's not that great. See, um, you know, believe me, I love Demon Hunter. I love Death Jaw. Sorry, Deathlock. Rich Buckler had some good stuff. But most of his career, he basically swiped from other artists and cranked out pages like a hack. And did a lot of goofy superhero shit. So this is based on the cover. You know, it's a pretty nice first page, at least. I think he's taking that pose from the cover. And it's a world almost like Kirby's Commandy, where there's like a panther city, there's a lion area. All these animals have attained sentience. But the humans are still alive. There's still like a bunch of humans. And we meet this woman, Shiva, and she's coming to Panther City to get vengeance. And we'll soon find out for what. So now we, we're introduced to Jihad. He's a really good gladiator. He keeps winning his matches. Unfortunately, in this culture, if you're a really good gladiator and you win like five matches, if you're champion, then you must serve as the temple guard and they geld you. You have to be a eunuch because in this society, pretty regularly, they have virgin sacrifices to appease their God. And they don't want the guards there to be able to take their virginity away from them before they're sacrificed. So you have to be a eunuch to work there. And he's just like, I don't want to do that. It's like, well, you have to, you know, his superior. So he's like, ah, oh, fuck. So now we cut away to this tavern and we see uh, 
Stormane, Morgan Stormane. He's a lion dude. And he's just once again getting drunk off his ass. This guy hates hangovers so much that his plan is to just stay drunk forever. He just tries to stay drunk so he never has to face the hangover. A barroom brawl breaks out. He's really pissed off. Beats the shit out of everyone because he's a lion guy. He's really strong. Meanwhile, Shiva's getting attacked by these panther guys who are trying to kidnap her. To the, They're going to sell her to the temple as a virgin sacrifice. But uh, Jihad the panther shows up to rescue her. He scares the other ones off. So Shiva tells him her tale. She lived more in the country with her uncle and aunt who brought her up. And one day this lion came out of nowhere. And just, he seemed out of his mind. And it was Morgan Stormane. And uh, Shiva tried to help, but her horse was so spooked it ran off. So she just figured, okay, I'm going to find that lion again and get revenge. So now we see Stormane causing a ruckus. He's drunk off his ass. And I guess the lion makes reference to murdering uh, those people. He was given some uh, poison mead, like tainted mead, by a mead merchant in that area where she was from. And it kind of drove him half mad. Normally he wouldn't kill a human. There's like treaties and stuff. So Morgan uh, goes to the palace. And then we cut back to Jihad and Shiva. And the high priest of the temple comes out and says, Jihad, you got to help us. You know, you're a champion. You're a master of combat. Some lion guys in our temple just lay in waste to it. And when he runs down to the catacombs and he uh, it leads out to this beach and Stormane is there, totally hungover. He's really messed up. And Jihad attacks him. And the whole time, Stormmate is thinking like, oh my God, I can barely stand up. Why does this guy keep attacking me? But he's such a formidable you know, warrior that he's still holding his own. But in his brain, he's not even there. He's in so much pain and discomfort. He's just like, ah. And then Shiva pops up out of nowhere. And she says that, you know, you can't kill him. I have to kill him. I forgot to mention, apparently in her culture, if you have some, like, blood revenge that you need to take care of, you can't marry until you have. So she has a fiancé waiting for him back home, but she can't marry him until she kills this lion. So uh, she succeeds just because he's so drunk. She takes a swipe at him with a sw her sword and he falls into the ocean. And he probably won't come back up because he's drunk. And Jihad realizes, well, this is a good thing. If as long as Morgan is alive, the temple can't chop off my dick put me in the, you know, in charge of these virgin sacrifices because they still want me to apprehend him. So actually throw some barrels in the water which rescue Stormane. And then they're all in the water. They've all fallen in and they're all clinging to these barrels. And uh, the leaders of the Panthers, Panther City are in charge of the army and they're 
catapulting shit at him. But uh, they swim back to the island, or not the island, uh, where the city is. And they kind of realize, uh, let's just have a truce. And it looks like they're going to go off to have adventures together. So I don't know if we ever saw that. I think this is the only appearance of these creatures. But yeah, pretty slight stuff. Uh, here we have little Otis's five cent ride. This is the return of John and Laura Lake Lakey from Artifact Studios. They did the Apocrypha two-parter just a few issues back. And this, once again, is their heavily photo-referenced -re art. You know, it kind of looks like retouched photos. Um, basically, for each comic story they do, they take hundreds of pictures of poses and stuff. And this is just a nostalgic little romp. Kind of reminds me of Christmas Story, that Gene Shepard, you know, movie. And this little kid is going to ride on one of these ponies. And I love this. It's as, he, as soon as he puts the nickel in, his imagination takes over. You know, he's a little kid. He's got a really strong imagination. And you, know, you notice how the normal stuff is in sepia tone. And then when he's in his fantasies, it's full, beautiful color. And he's riding the thing through the de beautiful desert scenery. And then it gets kind of like the Christmas story, but more like the Apple Dumpling Gang. Uh, he's riding in a town because these bank robbers are robbing the bank. And they're just buffoons. I mean, these guys, they might as well be Don Knotts and Harvey Corman. So uh, the little kid takes him out. Not lethal, lethally, of course. They keep saying he's just got a cap gun. But uh, he's kicking these guys' asses. And then the mayor of the town comes and uh, says, I'd like to give you this reward. It's pretty big. And the people are demanding that he becomes the new sheriff. Sorry, sheriff, I meant to say. And this guy's oblivious. He's just like, oh, you kidders. So he gives uh, the little kid a marshal badge. And then when the kid comes out of his imaginative reverie, his uh, ride has stopped. His nickel has lasted as long as it could. And uh, he's got the Sheriff's Star badge on his chest. So it wasn't a dream, was it? It like bleeds over into reality. So that's it for Epic 29. Pretty decent issue. Um, not one of my favorites, but definitely not one of the worst. Uh, just for that Rick Veit story. It's one of my favorite Rick Veit short stories ever. That Ghost in the Machine, really good stuff. Okay, thanks for watching, guys, and hopefully I'll see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.